It is uh, an honor and pleasure to welcome you to a public lecture by Professor Paul Kahn from Yale University. Um, let me, uh, with your permission, introduce uh, Professor Kahn and then uh, say a few words about his work and about the context of tonight's lecture. Uh, Professor Paul Kahn is the Robert W. Winner Professor of Law and the Humanities and the director of the Orville H. Shell Junior Center for Interdisciplinary Human Rights at Yale Law School. Professor Kahn teaches in the areas of constitutional law and theory, international law, cultural theory, and philosophy. Before coming to Yale in 1985, he clerked for Justice White in the United States Supreme Court and practiced law in Washington, D.C., during which time he was on the legal team representing Nicaragua before the International Court of Justice. Professor Kahn is the author of numerous books. I stopped counting somewhere after number 12. Um, but I was asking uh, Paul the other night, how, how does he, you know, I was impressed by his prolific writing. He said, it's, you know, you write five, five pages a day. By the end of the year, you'll have a book. So there's the advice uh, I'm taking from this. Uh, but the trick is, he said, not to repeat yourself too much. And though I will be emphasizing one thread, one theme uh, from uh, Professor Kahn's writing, it is important for me to emphasize the variety of topics that he has written about on love, on evil, on the problem of evil, on going to the movies and law. Um, uh, but the, the one thread that I want to emphasize for tonight's discussion concerns the relationship between law and politics. Um, Professor Kahn rejects the common liberal understanding of law uh, and politics, where we think of politics as imposing external limitations on law, known to us all as the rule of law, and of special uh, importance, uh, not only for our discussion this evening, but I think for Israeli society in our day and time, where law is seen as this uh, mechanism, the system of rules that intervenes and limits uh, politics. Paul offers a different understanding. Law, for him, is inherently political. Political not, of course, in the sense of the politics of interest, but rather in the more originary sense of politics as polis, as the pole, uh, the axis around which a people gather, and the law as the binding of the people, one can say, binding of a people as a people for the people uh, in the American context, we, the people. And that's part of uh, what Paul has been working on, Professor Kahn has been working on for the past years in different books, making the case, the art of the judicial, judicial opinion that came out in 2016, uh, where the question is how courts can form legal decisions in a way that would make them the voice of the people, that they would be speaking as we the people. Um, so concerned with uh, the way in which the legal system, uh, in which law turns into a legal system, into, in the ways in which law is understood merely as a, as, as a rules, as a rule of law, uh, uh, as a system rather than a project in his most recent origins of order, project and system in the American legal uh, imagination. Um, he has, following in some ways Schmidt, but also turning, in my opinion, Schmidt on his head, he has made a point of uh, the, the, the rule of politics, but not of po only of politics, but also of the, of the Supreme Court and courts in general, in a decisionism that is not bound, bind by uh, pre-existing uh, rules, and as courts creating, in some sense, states of exception in a book, fascinating book called Political Theology, Four New Chapters on the Concepts of Sovereignty. This interest in law and politics, law as politics in this sense, has also led Professor Kahn to expand our understanding of how we do uh, legal research and how we think about law as culture in an important and, and path-breaking book at the time, The Cultural Study of Law, Reconstructing Legal S Scholarship, 
a book that is still a guide for many of us today. Um, it's, it's easy to see from this point of view why the question of sacrifice becomes important and uh, the question of the political economy of blood. So um, I, many of you here are participants in the workshop that we started this morning and that we will continue tomorrow. So let me just mention a word about that and take the opportunity also to welcome many of our guests coming from abroad and also local participants in the workshop where the question of sacrifice has become central to the discussion and is relevant also to Professor Khan's work, the understanding that uh, for politics to work, it needs to um, call on us uh, to uh, sacrifice, to be willing uh, to, in the extreme, to willing to kill and uh, be killed. And the violence inherent in law and politics is a theme that uh, Professor Khan has been working on for a long time, Sacred Violence, Torture, Terror, and Sovereignty from 2008. Today, Professor Paul Khan will be talking to us about the political economy of blood and the importance of having a political economy of blood, not only to strengthen our polity, but also to counter uh, other forces in other economies, for example, the market economy. So, um, before I invite Professor Khan to deliver his talk, let me say that uh, following his talk, we will hear uh, a response by Dr. Julie Cooper from Tel Aviv University. I'll present Julie when her time comes. Let me take this opportunity also to thank uh, the organizers of the workshop and of tonight's uh, lecture. Uh, first and foremost, Orit Malka and Omar uh, Michaelis, and also Daphne Schreiber, who was here from uh, the Vanir Jerusalem Institute for her role in organizing this. And Dr. Yochi Fischer is here, um, the head of the Sacredness, uh, Religion and Secularism cluster, research cluster here at the Institute. And as always, thank you also to Ma behind the camera. And uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Professor Khan. Is that good? Uh, well, thank you for the introduction, and thank you uh, to the people at Van Leer for in inviting me, and thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks in particular to my students, ex-students, uh, and friends. Uh, I'm touched that you came. Uh, OK, uh, and uh, Shai gave you a, a pretty good summary of what I'm about to say, so oh. you stole my line. So what can I say? <laughs> um, uh, OK, and I, I have a little bit of a cold, so forgive me if I, if I start uh, coughing. Um, in this talk, uh, I'm going to draw a contrast between an economy of markets and an economy of blood. I call them both economies because they share the character of exchange of giving something up in return for something judged to be of greater value. <clears throat> and because in both, individual transactions give shape to and are shaped in turn by an imminent order. My claim is that political theory has been preoccupied with the market, <clears throat> while it needs to pay more attention to the economy of blood. To make the argument, I'm going to move through different kinds of materials, political theory, religious practice, popular culture, and a good deal of American history. I apologize for that. Uh, I'll try to hold these diverse materials together by keeping the contrast between economies present to mind. Much of my argument will draw on political intuitions that I believe to be broadly shared in American practice. I have a suspicion that they are not so dissimilar from those of Israelis. I might, of course, be completely wrong about this, uh, and I will be uh, delighted to hear about that uh, uh, from you. So I begin with an observation. A political community uh, that cannot call its citizens to sacrifice is not just weak militarily. It has little centripetal force to counter the centrifugal forces of the market. Something like this is at issue in the European Union today. It cannot call on citizens to sacrifice. It may fall apart from lack of political gravity, despite its tremendous economic force. At home, I think I see the same sort of thing 
<clears throat> the same sort, the same sort of thing, a disappearance of the sacrificial imagination, and a disintegration of the national community. A state is not just an administratively convenient way to deal with market failures. To think this would be like thinking the family to be just an efficient way to deal with reproduction. If that is all we see in the state, <clears throat> we may indeed be at the end of history. For political history is the narrative of the state as a transgenerational collective agent. The American Revolution, for example, is a part of American history in a way that the glorious revolution is not. Both are causally connected to the events of today, but only the former is imagined <clears throat> as an act by the same agent, the popular sovereign, with which contemporary citizens can still identify. Absent that imagined agency, history is no longer a narrative, but only a chronology of events linked together as cause and effect. I like to say one damn thing after another. A natural history is such a chronology, which is to say that nature has no history. Similarly, markets have no history because they have no transgenerational collective agency. We might study past market performance in order to make predictions of the future. We look for causes, not for reasons. Reasons are grounds of actions that we attribute to, to subjects who have deliberate intentions. Absent an, an account of intentions, we cannot think of the past as our own. Investors may want to know about the causes of economic phenomena, but citizens need to know the reasons, the reasons that constitute the history of the state. Of course, this does not mean <clears throat> that they will uncritically accept those reasons. Historical narrative may contain much that we, have, we, we think to have been mistaken or wrong, but they are our mistakes. We think, about the, we, <clears throat> we think the same about the narrative of our, of our individual lives. We have made mistakes. An economy links the particular to the general. The event and the system are equiprimordial. The relationships are reciprocal. A market exists only in and through particular transactions. Those transactions only exist in a market. The economy of blood has the same structure. The popular sovereign exists only in and through imagined acts of sacrifice. Those acts only exist as points for the realization of the transgenerational collective agent that is the sovereign. An act of individual sac sacrifice is an exchange in which the finite body becomes the point of a showing forth of the popular sovereign, that is, of the agent of history. Even the modern democratic state, I would say, is not so far from the king's two bodies. The political, political economy of blood is set within the social imaginary of history. The unity of the state as a, as a historical actor is the displacement of the private individual uh, by the public citizen. Private citizens are as multifarious as market interests. Citizens are all the same across space and time. We do not value one more than another. A political sacrifice, accordingly, always looks backward and forward at the same time. It is a sort of temporal disturbance. That is, it makes present the whole of the life of the nation. Lincoln captured this in the Gettysburg Address when he spoke of the sacrifices giving the nation, quote, a new birth of freedom and proving that, again, quote, it shall not perish from the earth. Through sacrifice, he's saying, the nation connects simultaneously with the revolutionary past and the indefinite democratic future. A sacrifice also concentrates space. Thus, Lincoln speaks of sacrifice consecrating the ground. It makes the specific, the specific spot hallowed ground, which is a sign and symbol of the whole. Sacrifice, accordingly, is the practice through which the we, as in we the people, emerges and renews itself. When the, distinction of value that operate, when the distinctions of value that operate in private life appear as distinctions among citizens, we have lost hold of the unity of the democratic state. A democratic state has a history and a place as long as its citizens can imagine their own acts of sacrifice. Not so long ago, this idea was an obvious political fact. The moment at which citizens would no longer sacrifice for the state was the moment of surrender. It was the end of the state as a single historical and territorial actor. We occupy the political then not just as the, we occupy the political then not just as the context 
within which we carry out <coughs> the business of private life. The state is not created for market repair. We do not imagine it as simply a means to an end. We are not indifferent to the identity of the state as if we could be dropped down in any state and make our way. Its rules are not directives like those of a game or a business, pra or a business practice. Its history is not just one among many or a subject about which we might be curious, as we are curious about natural histories. <clears throat> Rather, the state appears as a claim, ultimately a claim on life itself. That claim remains even when we disagree with the government or with our fellow citizens. It appears well before we enter into any consensual relationship with the state. We are claimed even when we do not consent. To understand the nature of the political, we have to consider the phenomenology of the claim which is to say that we have to consider the imaginative construction of sacrifice as the point of displacement of the finite by the transcendent. Against the shadow of this ultimate claim, we experience the multiple ordinary claims of politics, claims upon our wealth, our time, our loyalty, and our identity. Often we are preoccupied with the claim on wealth, that is, taxes. This is actually the least revealing of the state's claims, for it can easily be, mis be mistaken as a fee for service, payment to support the public goods upon which we rely. All sorts of organizations, however, <clears throat> charge fees for services. This cannot distinguish the political. The political claim of a tax is always a redistributive claim. Not a fee for service, but an obligation to support the collective agency of the state as it decides on public projects. I pay taxes, for example, to support public schools, even when I have no children in those schools. It's an obligation of citizenship to maintain the conditions by which the state reproduces itself. This is, that is not something that I get in exchange for taxes. It is claim, not contract. It is the paradigmatic taking for a public good for a public end, for, for which no compensation need be given. Compensation is a matter of law, but the exceptional claim of sacrifice always exceeds the law. Thus, we argue about tax rates, but we do so under the shadow of an ultimate claim at the exceptional moment. At that moment, the state can set the tax, the, can set the rate at 100%. It will, take, <clears throat> it will take all my property and life itself. The character of the, of the political emerges not in the authority of the state's laws, but in its capacity to make a total claim upon the territory, the wealth, and the subjects of the community. That ultimate claim actually extends well beyond the state's jurisdictional boundaries, the limits of its legal reach. Thus, states, states at least some states, threaten world destruction as a condition of their own existence. Their history, appears as not just the meaning of their lives, but as the source of all meaning. They can see no value outside of this claim. The state has exactly the same problem as traditional religious faiths. They too could see no value in other faiths. Those others are always worshiping false gods. The most difficult problem of political tolerance is not that of recognizing a plurality of religions within the state. It is that of recognizing the political life of other states. It is always extremely difficult to grasp what that value can be, for it is as radically foreign as different gods. If we thought that modernity had overcome this problem of political tolerance, Trump has reminded us that it has not. America first. The polity then joins two economies. One builds wealth and secures well-being. The other destroys wealth and threatens death. The former is an economy of interests, the latter of claim. The market economy easily overcomes borders. The economy of blood cannot survive without borders. Modern political theory has tried to collapse claim into consent. Traditional political theology tried to collapse consent, <coughs> tried to collapse consent into claim. The modern state is often theorized as if it were a market phenomenon, even as it is, is experienced as if it were a church. The double nature of politics is expressed in theories that speak of high and low politics, of constitutive and constituted assemblies, or of the exception and the normal. The two economies support a twofold ontology of the state. 
Its land is both property and territory. Its private wealth is public resource. Its citizens are market participants until they are conscripted. Conscription today is not a matter of formal law. When those lawyers and brokers went to, went to work in the World Trade Center on 9-11, they went as market participants. By noon, they had been conscripted. Their deaths have become sacrifices for the state. They are <clears throat> memorialized as such. This is the nature of war today, informal conscription into the front line of battle with an enemy who can appear anywhere at any time and in any, <clears throat> and in any form. As Agamben says, the line between peace and war, between civilian and combatant, has become indistinct. Citizenship is the site of a political transubstantiation, which is another way of saying that imagining sacrifice is constitutive of the state. The imagination's task is to inscribe the act of sacrifice in a narrative. When the narrative fails, the sacrificial act becomes a death without meaning, or more accurately, or accurately, without a public meaning, for every death is a private tragedy. At that point, we experienced politics as violent, a violent threatening force. Americans had this experience with the Vietnam War. Interestingly, they recovered from the political trauma only as they slowly managed to reinvest those deaths with a sacrificial meaning. That's why the, the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, DC has been so important to the transformation of memory. Political narratives today <clears throat> must refer to contemporary norms of justice and well-being, the terms of ordinary politics. We make a mistake, however, if we think those norms are the source <clears throat> or a necessary condition of the political claim. That claim, we know all too well, can continue well after the state lapses into injustice. Indeed, the state is always in a partial state of injustice, yet citizens believe. To understand the, re the relationship of claim to justice, it is again helpful to draw an analogy to family. Because I love my children, I want them to be just. I do not love them because they are just. The same ordering occurs <coughs> with respect to the political. In both, cases, the in, in, the, in both cases, the injustice can become so great that one is compelled to abandon the relationship. In both cases, that experience is tragedy. If injustice points to the tragedy of the political, then the felt dissipation of the claim points to the comedy. At some point, we may lose our faith not because politics has become too unjust, but because it has become empty of meaning. We no longer hear the claim. Just as with the failure of religious faith, we no longer see through, <coughs> see through the ritual to the sacred. When that happens, taxes become a fee for service, at best, <coughs> Uh, and they become theft at worst. When the political narrative fails, we respond to the claim with the question, what's in it for me? The very prominence of this question in contemporary American politics suggests that our history as the narrative of the agency of a trans-temporal collective agent may be coming to an end. That's a different meaning of the end of history. Experienced as claim, the state is the site of a collective narrative of the state is a site of endless a narrative contestation. We are constantly constructing, contesting, and reconstructing the meaning of the state. We are never done with this conversation because we are trying to put into words that which is beyond words. This phenomenon of the claim that grounds speech, but is always beyond speech, is not unique to politics. Think of Rudolf Otto on the Mysterium Tremendum, Emmanuel Levinas on the face, or even Roger Scruton on God. Nevertheless, politics has been the most prominent site of the appearance of the transcendence, transcendence since the American and French revolutions. The nation has had about it the quality of the sacred. There are multiple forms of narrative contestation of the political. Novelists create, historians interpret, lawyers contest, politicians campaign, and judges write opinions. We learn the meaning of citizenship as much at the movies as in the classroom. To maintain the unity of the state as a historical actor takes a lot of work, cultural, social, legal, and political. The July 4th <coughs> parade is not enough. 
We are, a, <coughs> we are, or we were until quite recently, embedded within a social imaginary organized around the, the political claim of we the people. Absent that social imaginary, political identity disappears into the, into the competing interests of its various parts. The claim of the state extends to us as an existential fact. It is not the conclusion of an argument, but the beginning. The claim is a superabundant source of meaning. This is the imaginative function of the idea of the popular sovereign, a reified subject that is always more than what it, what it has done, always greater than what can be said, and always the exception beyond the rule. <clears throat> we acknowledge the claim when we respond, not when we can offer a convincing proof. When political theory tries to offer proofs of the obligation to obey the law, it inevitably misses the phenomenon of the political. This is why Carl Schmidt identifies the sovereign with the decision. The political question is always, what will you do? So I'm trying to describe a modern political conundrum. States dream of peace, but they cannot have peace without becoming something other than they are. They bring meaning into the world through the imagination of sacrifice. A state stripped of its capacity for sacrifice, one in which its citizens no longer imagine sacrifice as an existential possibility, is not a successful political community, but something that is not political at all. This hardly means that we are bound to politics as if the human nature itself. Sacrifice is not the only site for the entry of meaning into the world, and politics is not the only site of sacrifice. The end of politics would not be the end of man. Nevertheless, we should not think that we know what a post-political world would look like. <clears throat> as long as the economy of blood exists, which is as long as the political formation of the state continues, political theory cannot avoid political theology. Strip theology from theory and we end up with accounts that are incommensurate with that which they're trying to explain. This is already have evident in Hobbes's Leviathan. Politics, Hobbes argued, begins with the flight from death. The subject's interest in life is so compelling, so much a part of human nature, that preservation of one's life is the first right of nature. It is that from which all of the laws of nature uh, follow. Of this alone, we can be certain. Men value their lives as the condition of all other values. Descartes began modern philosophy with the certainty of the thinking self. Hobbes begins modern political theory with the certainty of the body. A rational agent, Hobbes argues, will consent to the social contract because the alternative is the threat of violent death in the state of nature. About Hobbes' argument, we might say that it works in theory, but not in practice. As countless social choice <clears throat> theorists have explained, <clears throat> just as it is rational to join the social contract, it can be rational to defect. In fact, it is always rational to defect when there is a real and immediate threat to your life. That is, it is rational to flee in the face of the claim. There is no answer to the question of why I should answer, honor, honor my contractual obligation at the cost of my own life. This paradox at the center of the Hobbesian state cannot be resolved. The state emerges as an answer to the problem of the threat to life posed by the state of nature, yet the citizen find, citizens find themselves threatened by the very machine created to protect their life. As a matter of first principles, the state and the individual are, <clears throat> at that moment, back in the state of nature. The state has become the enemy. Confronting a threat, the individual recovers his right to save his life which is why Hobbes tells us prisoners are under the watch of armed guards and why military officers stand behind their troops with weapons strong. The state is in the same position as the slave owner. Slave and master are in a perpetual state of war. They are in that state even if the master treats the slave well, and even if the individual consented to slavery over death at the moment of defeat. No person can contract away his natural right to life. Citizens, Hobbes tells us, are as slaves. Hobbes argues that the state of war exists as long as there is a threat of violence between states, even if matters are presently peaceful. By that reasoning, again, citizens are always at war with the state. 
It may not be a just war, but life, not justice, was the ground of citizen consent. As long as the first principle is life itself, there is no way around this, at least none that I can see. The deepest problem for the state, accordingly, is to keep citizens enthralled, enthralled to the political, even as it makes a claim upon their lives. That is impossible on death row, but it is possible on the battlefield. When states fail, when the troops, when the troops turn around and go home, it's not because their lives are threatened, but because their God has died. They no longer believe. They no longer believe that the institutions of government express the sovereign voice. That voice may now be located elsewhere. We know that experience is revolution. Or it may simply have gone silent. We know that experience is the displacement of the political by markets. This is the paradox of political origins. Creating the Leviathan to escape death, we create an institution that threatens our own lives. The state may end a, a regime of murder, but it substitutes a regime of sacrifice. Hobbes failed to explain that moment of transubstantiation in which the contract for the sake of life becomes a claim of sacrifice. Absent faith, every sacrifice can take on the appearance of murder. We find in that case that we never really left the state of nature. <clears throat> the Hobbesian conundrum arises whenever one tries to construct the meaning of sovereignty through an appeal to consent. The social contract is literally a dead end. Political theory needs to reimagine the point of origin, not the exit from the state of nature, but rather as the moment of conscription, formal or informal. The theory of the political has to answer the question of the possibility of citizen sacrifice. Here, we might start with the story of Abraham and Isaac which presents the paradox of origins as a narrative of the claim. Now, I'm going to say some things that uh, we talked about in the, in the conference today that got me wondering whether I have any of this right at all. <laughs> so you can tell me that uh, too. <laughs> um, God promises Abraham that he will be father to a great nation. But then he demands the sacrifice of Isaac, the only legitimate son. This is not a consensual contractual relationship. It is the appearance of the claim. And the question is, what will Abraham do? It is a test of faith, and faith is incommensurable with consent. Fathers will not consent to the murder, <laughs> the murder of their sons, no matter what the promised reward. We are here in the economy of blood. Abraham must have faith in, in that which is beyond reason. Politics <clears throat> is a form of the miraculous until faith fails, at which point it is only murder. The life of the nation and the death of the son are linked when Abraham decides for the claim. History, as the existential presence of the nation, demands sacrifice of the sons. This is the mythic representation of the sacrificial economy, the displacement of the individual's finite value by the transcendent value of the nation. That value is represented in myth as flowing from God to the nation. We live not only in a world in which <clears throat> the property of the nation is passed on to children, to secure their well-being, but one in which the values are reversed and the children are claimed for the nation. The sacred shows itself through the destruction of the finite, property and life. Isaac dies as son, but is resurrected as nation. The signers of the Declaration of Independence pledge not just their property, but also their lives in support of a new beginning of history. This was an act of faith. If they had failed, they would have been punished for their crimes and lost to history. If Abraham had not been willing to sacrifice Isaac, the Jews would have been a group of families lost to time, and they would have, <clears throat> just as they would have been lost in the territories claimed by other peoples. God intervenes in an act of grace. Saving Isaac, he saves the nation, that is, all of the descendants of Abraham. He invests death with meaning, which is exactly what Hobbes cannot do. Neither can the market economy. Sacrifice of the child realizes the sacred as the organization of history. The lamb is not a substitute, as in a trade, of one for another, but the symbol of the divine ordering of time. Nations live off the sacrifices of the children. There is no lamb. Or more precisely, as citizens, we are all lambs. We are that as long as there is faith. 
We think of ourselves as modern, but the political imaginary has not detached itself from these origins. The modern state, as we actually have known it, hardly ended the threat of death. It has instead been the, great, the greatest instrument of sacrifice ever created. Tens of millions of individuals have been caught up in political violence. We all live under the threat of political violence today. Thinking about end times, we're not sure whether it will come from the destruction of the environment wrought by markets or from a nuclear exchange wrought by politics. Most people think that this should end and that we should save ourselves from both threats. But we don't know how, for we would have to become something other than we have been. That does not make change impossible, for we are, for we are not essentially one thing rather than another. It just reminds us of how difficult the task is, for it is nothing less than reinventing ourselves. Historically, American, American defenders of slavery distinguished slaves from free men, free, free white men, by claiming that blacks were concerned with mere life, while whites measured themselves by their willingness to sacrifice. As property, slaves could have no horizon greater than life itself, for that was the limit of their value. White people had civilization. They were no longer merely natural, because they were willing to sacrifice themselves for ideas like honor, family, and nation. Slave liberation came with black participation in the Union armies, sacrificing they were worthy of citizenship. Not surprisingly, knowledge of this sacrifice became an important element of the Southern Sorry, not surprisingly, su suppressing knowledge of this sacrifice became an important element of the Southern narrative of Reconstruction. If blacks are slaves by nature, then the possibility of their sacrifice is ruled out in advance. Their blood cannot sustain the sovereign presence in a double sense. They are not up to it, and the white people will not recognize it. This history is present in compressed form in the slogan, Black Lives Matter. Only when their lives matter do their deaths count. They count, then, as sacrifices. This was a hard lesson for Americans to learn. It is one that we may be forgetting. Denying the humanity of the other is a particularly virulent form of evil. Paradoxically, the recognition of humanity has been tied to a practice of sacrifice. We become fully human when we, are when we, are willing, when we willingly transcend the limits of the body. This idea, so tied to dignity, is one of the things that makes our reinvention so difficult. The economy of blood appears to us as a claim. It calls upon us and measures our performance. We are all intimately aware of this kind of calling, for the family, too, is an economy of blood. Here, too, we experience a claim for sacrifice that is beyond words. Of course, families are concerned about the well-being of their members, but so is the state. The claim for sacrifice does not deny this. Rather, it speaks to the conditions under which that concern for well-being can flourish. This is Schmidt's famous point. The exception grounds the norm. With the family, as in politics, we experience this call to sacrifice as love. About love, we can never reason the need. Just as a market economy tends to blur the line between interests and politics, the economy of blood blurs the line between <laughs> politics and family. A politics that is no longer directed by a concern for the children and grandchildren is a pathological politics. It's, it is as if Abraham sacrificed Isaac for himself rather than for his descendants. Modern political theory began by distinguishing familial order from political order. That's a valuable point, if properly understood. A modern state does not replicate the patriarchal order of the family. Its form is a project of deliberate construction responsive to ideas of equality, dignity, and justice. But the state is not only a project of reason and consent. It has one foot there, but the other is in the economy of blood, meaning the presence of the claim and the practice of sacrifice. We know all of this as the background of our political identities. The soldier who dies is also a son or a daughter. Parents will not ordinarily give over their children to fight the wars of some other state, no matter how just that war might be. That some authoritarian regime is treating its own citizens poorly is not a reason for me to sacrifice my children. 
Sacrifice responds to a particular historical call, not to a theory of justice. States have armies. Neither the EU nor the UN have the power to conscript, although both make valuable contributions to a just political order. Of political theory, we properly ask whether it has identified the ground upon which parents will sacrifice their children. If it has not, it has not yet reached the phenomena of the political, regardless of how powerfully it develops the theory of justice. Years ago, I expressed this point as an iron law of American popular film. Shai mentioned I wrote a book about movies. So the law is there is no political narrative that is not also a family narrative. And we can think about movies. They all, they all follow this, this uh, form. For Americans, the White House is a symbol of the link between political order and familial order. A disturbance in the familial order shows itself in the political and vice versa. Plato is right on the unity of all forms of love. If the claim is beyond words, then there cannot be a differentiation with the, within the claim. It puts at stake an entire world. Perhaps that's why so many Americans have trouble distinguishing faith in the nation from their Christian faith. It cannot be an accident that after the great political sacrifices of the Civil War, it became a commonplace to refer to America as a Christian nation. One might have expected just, just the opposite. That's ironic only to someone who does not understand the, the place of faith in the experience of the political. If the social contract gets the place of violence wrong, it gets the priority of freedom right. The social contract properly locates the origin of the state in a free act. We freely consent to the contract. <clears throat> Nature is a site of violent conflict in which freedom can get no purchase, for every act is determined by the threat of others. Politics, in the Hobbesian view, creates a space for freedom by protecting the grounds of every choice, life itself. The social contract is necessary given man's, essentially non non, man's essential non-sociability. It creates the possibility of making one's own life a project. This idea of freedom is expressed most famously in Kant's essay, What is Enlightenment? The free person gives the law to himself. He shapes himself and his actions according to an idea. This is pretty much the lesson of Hobbes' political theory as well. Today, we continue this Hobbesian idea when we debate something like universal basic income. It will secure the conditions under which individuals can freely choose among possibilities. The possibilities that we imagine are those of a market economy. So that's the Hobbesian idea. Political theology agrees that the origins of the state lie in freedom. It conceives of the free act, however, in an entirely different manner. It conceives of it as sacrifice. Only a free subject can enter a contract. Only a free subject can sacrifice. Political sacrifice, for this reason, is always beyond law. There can be no law requiring a sacrificial act because the coercive apparatus of law negates the free response to the claim, which is always <clears throat> the claim which defines the sacrificial act. This, too, is represented in fiction. The suicide mission always depends upon volunteers. Think again of families. Parents can be required by law to give up a lot for their children, but they cannot be required to give up their laws, uh, their lives. This they must do freely. freely. Politics does not begin with the imagined killing of another, but with the imagined sacrifice of the self. These two moments are, are, however, intimately related in the political imaginary. A killing becomes political only when it occurs in a space of existential risk. Political violence is a killing and being killed. Each side understands itself as sacrificing for the transcendent meaning of its own community. Each side creates the, the, each side creates the need for sacrifice by imagining an enemy. The state accordingly exists only within a world of multiple states. Each maintains the other by offering itself as a potential threat. The ontological need is to sacrifice, for that's the moment of self-realization. That need is experienced as the claim. The narrative constructed to maintain the claim is one of friends and enemies. A single world state would not be a political entity at all. That, <clears throat> that does not make such a state a less attractive, less attractive as an aspiration. 
We might have good reason to prefer a state without politics. We should be clear, however, that it is like preferring a religion without God. A religious community might continue to exist as an ethical practice concerned with the well-being of its members. That might be a good thing. There is, of course, no neutral place from which to make that judgment. The contrast of sacrifice and contract shows us that an idea of freedom always rests on a metaphysics. Kant expressed this as the problem of causal determinism. The problem is more general. A theory of freedom rests upon a set of beliefs about our relationship to the world. The unbound freedom would be an empty abstraction. If we were alone in the world, we could not say whether we were free. We would have no <laughs> measure. The proposition would make no sense. Freedom, despite first impression, is something we do together. What we do, contract or sacrifice, depends upon all of our other beliefs. A contract puts meaning into the world through reciprocal acts of consent. The source of meaning is the individual, which is why the tracing of the origins of the social contract leads so quickly to bare life. A sacrifice resp responds to a calling that is in the world. That is why we cannot speak of sacrifice without invoking ideas of the transcendent. Breaking a contract is not the same as turning away from the sacred. Hobbes thinks that the state can enforce the social contract at the point of a gun, but it would make no sense to imagine Abraham coerced into sacrificing Isaac. A, pop, a political economy of blood, accordingly, is a metaphysics of freedom. A failure to act freely in this world is what we mean by sin. We confuse categories if we try to explain sin on causal grounds. We can only sin when we can freely give ourselves over to the presence of the sacred. To sin is to turn away. In politics, that is an act of betrayal. There are no sins in the economy of the market, but only bad deals. There are violations of law there, and there is punishment. But punishment is not sacrifice, and the law cannot speak to the claim. This contrast of contract and sacrifice puts a good deal of pressure on the point of political origins. Not just modern political theory, but modern political practice emphasizes origins. The Mayflower, Mayflower Compact pre precedes Hobbes' Leviathan by about 30 years. That compact acknowledges the Christian mission of Plymouth, the first colony in New England, but the compact's actual function is to create a civic body politic. The church needs a contractual supplement to take up a civic project of political order. The compact accordingly establishes the conditions for a commonwealth by constituting a political community alongside a religious community. The compact answers the question always posed by social contract theory. Where do the boundaries of the Leviathan come from? Who is inside and who is outside? And the compact answers those on the boat. I suspect my reading of the Abraham and Isaac story would have been uh, received favorably by those on the Mayflower, for they saw politics as a space for the realization of a religious faith. Constructing a new polity through contract, they expected divine intervention. Their polity was to be the Lamb of God, which means the presence of the sacred in time. Their city on the hill was to be the New Jerusalem, the presence around which history will form again. They gave new meaning to Locke's claim that in the beginning, all the world was America. The compact marks the new beginning of an old world faith. The compact is drafted as a supplement to, not a displacement of, a mission, a mission of Christian faith. Civil order under the compact has as its end the realization of a religious project of making present the Christian God. Not so for Hobbes whose explanation turns from God to the body. The history of the modern state, however, is as much Mayflower as Hobbes. This is what makes the political not just a companion to religious belief, but the continuation of a Western practice of faith. The subordination of the civil order to religious faith continued in New England for about 100 years after the compact. Membership in the town meeting, the political body, is limited or was limited to those who are members of the church. Politics gradually separates from sectarian faith, such that by the time of the revolution, religious faith is a supplement to politics, rather than the other way around. The role of religion for the founders is pretty much limited to providing training, to providing training in virtuous behavior, a necessary 
a necessity of citizenship in a republic. Contemporary uh, Americans are always astounded by how irreligious the, fa uh, the founders were. Thus, the Declaration of Independence ends with a mutual and reciprocal pledge of life for a political project that is no longer dependent upon God. That is the moment of political origins of a new form of faith, the object of which is we the people. America has become a secular nation. That did not mean an absence of faith, but a transfer of the object of faith from God to the people. That new faith was no less a sacrificial practice. That new nation has been at war or preparing for war virtually its entire life. Read the front page of the New York Times today. Tocqueville got it right when in the 1830s he described the popular sovereign as America's God hovering over politics. It asks us always, what will you do? A state that is no longer confident that it knows how its citizens will answer that question is no longer a political formation, although it may continue as a bureaucratic <clears throat> or market organization. When politics <clears throat> recedes as a site of the sacrificial imagination, it should not surprise us that evangelicals step forward, seeing in politics the possibility of realizing a distinctly religious meaning. After 400 years, some members of our community are returning to the ethos of the Mayflower. The secularism, the secularism of today often appears as if it is in a contest with what strikes many as the remnants of archaic religions. Those remnants can be Christian, Jewish, Hindu, or Islamic. I have tried to suggest that there is a deeper and, to my mind, more important contest between the economy of markets and that of blood. <laughs> if it seems that the latter, the economy of blood, is disappearing in the face of the former, market economies, then we might be right to conclude that the death of the political is not a successor to an earlier death of God, but rather the final stage in what turned out to be a long but terminal a terminal disease of the sacred. Many will find relief at the idea that the illness is finally over and, the patient, and that the patient can be buried. I think it's not so simple. The experience of the claim is not going to go away because its source is in our own need for self-transcendence. The economy of blood is not a failure to grasp the economy of markets any more than love is a failure of contract. How states will fit within the new formations of the economy of blood is the question of our day. For those who worry about this question, the answers so far are deeply troubling. The rise of white nationalism linked to evangelicalism in the United States shows us one possible future. The United States is hardly the only place in which this sort of thing is happening. The conventional response often seems to be to blame the rise of populist nationalism on the failure of the economy of markets to achieve a just distribution. <laughs> Maybe. But I suspect it rests on a, <clears throat> as much on a failure of the economy of blood. Old claims to sacrifice no longer speak to us. We are losing our history, even as we are constantly entertained. We do not hear the claim of the political, and so we do not respond as Abraham did, here am I. We need, however, to remember that a sacrificial politics can lay dormant and then explode into our imaginations. Something like that happened on 9-11. We cannot know in advance whether there will be a response to the call. We cannot know because it must be a free act. Nevertheless, I suspect that many Americans have lost, lost their faith. Who can have faith in a politics that produces Trump as a sign and symbol of the meaning of citizenship? Not coincidentally, he never uses the language of sacrifice, but always asks, what's in it for me? And that may be what the end of history looks like. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Paul. This was uh, a challenging uh, talk, uh, and and perhaps uh, also a wake up uh, a wake up call um, to, to rethink the questions of of politics. As you were speaking, I was thinking of Israeli politics, and I, I was um, always had this sense that with all the criticisms that all of us have in different ways about Israeli politics, the bright spot of Israeli politics, that, that this was about real issues. That is, it wasn't about some, you know, uh, big administration 
of uh, mundane affairs, as you can see in other countries here, it was really about uh, life and, and, and death and about significant questions. But thinking, hearing you and thinking about Israeli politics, I, I'm wondering whether Israeli politics is not simultaneously a politics of sacrifice in the sense that it calls us to uh, kill and be killed, uh, but also perhaps empty of meaning uh, in many ways, uh, and no longer drawing uh, the community, the political community as a community, giving rise to uh, cynicism and uh, to, uh, disenchantment with politics. Or to put it differently, uh, Israeli society could be an interesting, Israeli politics could be an interesting case of a merger uh, between an economy of blood and uh, an economy of, of markets. And, and how does that work and how does that figure within, within the framework is interesting. But now, I guess uh, I am eager, I, I'm sure you are all, are all eager too to hear uh, Julie Cooper, who's a senior lecturer in the political science department at Tel Aviv University. Her research interests uh, include history of political theory, early modern political thought, especially Hobbes and Spinoza, secularism and secularization, Jewish political thought, and modern Jewish thought. She is the author of Secular Powers, Humility in Modern Political Thought that came out in Chicago University Press in 2013. And for me, it was a really an eye-opener on how to think about a question that I have been thinking for a while uh, about the question of, of secularism and, and how to rethink it uh, sort of beyond what we often think that sort of uh, secularism, the, in a Nietzschean sense, the death of God, the rise of, of man, and the will to power, and how um, Julie Cooper points to the, the existence of this alternative or other uh, quite significant uh, secularism of humility that is not only in Kant, which we could have imagined, but uh, in the center of Hobbes. I think it's a very powerful argument that she makes. Uh, her works appeared in journals, including uh, Review of Politics, Historical Journal, Political Theory, uh, and Jewish Quarterly Review. She's currently working on a book project tentatively entitled Politics Without Sovereignty, question mark, Exile, State, and Territory in Jewish Thought that examines modern attempts to reimagine and rehabilitate Judaism's national and political dimensions. Julie, please. So first, I want to thank uh, Omar and Orit for all of their work organizing this great event. And of course, I want to thank Professor Khan for this very challenging paper, which I take as a, an eloquent and passionate and very provocative brief for the political and the exacting demands that it makes on us. And actually, following up on Shai's remarks, I'm actually going to talk about what I see as the potential merger between these two economies. Um, but, but first, let me, let me talk a little bit just about the, what I see as Paul's really important reminder in this talk, which is the reminder that he is able to articulate using the resources of political theology that the state is not merely a technical instrument for the maximization of self-interest. It's also a source of meaning, identity, and connection. Moreover, Professor Khan vividly illustrates the state's unique claim to our property and our persons. The state may legitimately appropriate our property via taxation, and it may legitimately endanger our lives via conscription. For this reason, I have to admit that I was somewhat perplexed by the repeated attempt to illustrate the priority of the political throughout the talk via analogies to the family. Granted, family ties are effective and as such entail myriad forms of sacrifice. Yet the binding of Isaac notwithstanding, in most democratic countries, social welfare agencies will intervene to remove children from parents who would sacrifice their lives or even their well-being in the name of transcendent ideals. To my mind, the power of Professor Kahn's argument derives from the stark reminder that the state occupies a categorically different standing from the family in modern legal systems, even while it invites an emotional cathexis that recalls family dynamics. Precisely because the state makes such consequential demands on our lives and our property, I would argue, citizens need critical tools sharp enough to counter the myriad forms of inequality that modern states create, enshrine, and exacerbate. 
I am skeptical, however, that what Professor Kahn calls the economy of blood provides sufficient leverage to generate the modes of egalitarian solidarity that I take it he hopes to cultivate, and that, that that's why he's invoking the economy of blood precisely to generate egalitarian solidarity. Professor Kahn contrasts the egalitarian ethos of the state, which is purportedly animated by the political economy of blood, with the discriminating logic of the market. Professor Kahn writes, private persons are as multifarious as market interests. Citizens are all the same across space and time. We don't value one more than another, end quote. Yet, as Professor Kahn himself notes, historically, the economy of blood has been emphatically hierarchical. The blood of male soldiers was dignified as heroic sacrifice, while the bloodiness of menstruation and childbirth marked the female body as grotesque, rendering women unfit for participation in public affairs. As the Binding of Isaac illustrates, sacrifice has historically been an all-male homosocial affair. Abraham does not consult with Sarah regarding the command to sacrifice Isaac. She's not a party to this decision. And famously, Sarah dies silently immediately after the sacrifice is averted. Moreover, in American history, racial discrimination, both formal and informal, has been predicated on rigid blood distinctions. According to the so-called one-drop rule of American racial taxonomy, one drop of supposedly black blood was enough to classify an individual as black and therefore subject to egregious forms of violence, discrimination, and dehumanization. As American history attests, it is rather difficult to recruit the economy of blood toward the achievement of egalitarian ends. Allowing women, say, to serve in combat units does not automatically undo the patriarchal assumptions on which this economy was historically founded. Indeed, blood only grounds an egalitarian order, I would argue, once Hobbes invokes it as the basis for the very social contract tradition, which Professor Kahn criticizes as insufficiently sacrificial and faith-based. But I want to focus my reservations on what might be a less obvious aspect of the argument, not the notion of blood itself, but the idea that blood constitutes an economy, and a counter-economy at that. Professor Kahn complains that political theorists' ostensible neglect of the blood economy has left modern states impotent in the face of the capitalist market. He writes, quote, a political community that cannot call upon its citizens for its defense is not just weak militarily, it has little centripetal force to counter the centripetal, centrifugal sorry, forces of the market. Here, Professor Kahn prevents the, presents the economy of blood as a counterweight to the market economy. While the market evaluates private individuals in all of their idiosyncrasy, the economy of blood is political precisely because it refuses any and all distinctions between citizens, forging powerful bonds of solidarity. To illustrate these conflicting logics, Professor Kahn invokes the response to and commemoration of the 9-11 attacks. On Professor Kahn's interpretation, 9-11 shows, quote, that conscription today is not a matter of formal law. When those lawyers and brokers went to work in the World Trade Center on 9-11, they went as market participants. By noon, they had been conscripted. Their deaths have become sacrifices for the state. They are memorialized as such. This is the nature of war today, unquote. Here, Professor Kahn narrates 9-11 as a revelatory experience of the political that overwhelms and undoes market logics. In the face of death at the hands of a ruthless enemy, in the Schmidian sense, Professor Kahn implies, we are no longer lawyers and brokers, we are citizen soldiers, and as such, equal in the eyes of the state. On closer inspection, however, 9-11 provides, to my mind at least, an especially pointed demonstration of the impotence of the economy of blood, its infiltration by and collusion with the market economy. Professor Kahn's stirring invocation notwithstanding, the accidents of fate that linked the 2,977 victims in death on 9-11 did not, in fact, elevate them to the status of citizen soldiers insulated from market pressures. Even in death, these exalted sacrificial lambs were not treated equally by the United States government. It goes without saying that the United States government did not extend posthumous U.S. citizenship to the 372 non-citizens killed on 9-11. More important, the means by which the government decided to compensate the victims of the attacks, the, nine, the September 11th Victim Compensation Fund, which was established immediately after the attacks, this fund relied on market principles to compensate the victims' families. The fund, administered by Special Master Kenneth Feinberg, was designed to preempt a wave of lawsuits that would have crippled the airline industry. 
Families who agreed not to sue the airlines were given a compensatory grant based on Feinberg's estimate of how much each victim would have earned over the course of his or her lifetime. That is, Feinberg was tasked with establishing the precise market value of each victim in terms of projected lifetime earnings, and the U.S. government compensated the victim's families accordingly. Admittedly, measures were taken to narrow the gap between the wealthiest and poorest victims and thereby ensure that the families of highly paid financial executives did not deplete the fund. Yet, in practice, the sums paid varied widely, ranging from $250,000, which was the lowest sum paid, to $7.1 million, which was the highest sum paid, and the average award was $2.1 million. On the evidence of the U.S. government's approach to victim compensation, the broyers, sorry, the brokers and lawyers, not the broyers, the brokers and lawyers who entered the towers as market participants remained market participants even in death on the supposed battlefield, as did the secretaries and busboys and dishwashers and first responders who also perished in the attacks. In short, this quintessential experience of the political did not, in fact, prompt a suspension or even a relaxation of market norms. Thus, to my mind, 9-11 suggests either that the economy of blood is too weak to contest the market, or that, contrary to Professor Kahn's claim, the two economies are actually mutually reinforcing. If the political aspiration is to create egalitarian solidarity that goes beyond instrumental calculations of interest, then the economy of blood, I would argue, is not the place to look. Of course, Professor Kahn could easily object that compensation of victims' families in accordance with market value demonstrates that we have yet to become truly political or that we've lost our faith in, in, in politics. The infiltration of market norms shows that we are perilously close to the end of history. And so to combat this attempted evacuation of the political at the very moment of its spontaneous self-revelation, we must revive earlier sacrificial ideals. Were political theorists to pay more attention to the economy of blood, Professor Kahn might reply, U.S. citizens would have a deeper appreciation for the transcendent meaning of the political and, accordingly, would display more willingness to sacrifice. Yet, I doubt that more blood is the answer, especially in a society like American society, awash with non-sacrificial blood, where mass shootings occur on a daily basis. The economy of blood is too easily co-opted by the market economy, and I would argue that this co-optation is scarcely surprising given the hierarchical underpinnings linking the two economies. To generate the desired bonds of solidarity, I would argue, political theorists would have to mount a more radical critique of the capitalist economy than Professor Kahn has ventured in this paper. Rather than pitting one economy against another, that is, we must challenge the priority of economy itself. Such a challenge might even come from theology, albeit not the political theology of Carl Schmitt, to which Professor Kahn grants a monopoly on the sacred. For Israeli citizens, Haredi ultra-Orthodox opposition to conscription is perhaps the most prominent example of a categorical refusal of the twin economies of blood and of the market. Proponents of ultra-Orthodox conscription increasingly justify their proposals in economic rather than civil terms. That is, instead of saying that the burden of service should be shared equally, proponents of Haredi conscription argue that military service is necessary as a gateway toward increased labor market participation on the part of the ultra-Orthodox. And I'd say that I, I would I know that that's the, the justifications for military service in America, where we have an all-volunteer army, are similar because most people who serve voluntarily in the U.S. Army do so because they correctly perceive the army as a vehicle for upward mobility. In coming back to Israel, when the ultra-Orthodox refuse military service in the name of an anti-martial, anti-Zionist theology, they evince willingness to secede from the market, voluntarily accepting a lower standard of living. Of course, Haredi society is also highly stratified, and in practice, men who learn full-time are able to opt out of the labor market not only because they receive state subsidies, but also because their wives work in the labor market. My point here is neither to romanticize Haredi society nor to take a position on the controversial question of Haredi conscription. Rather, I have tried to show how these ostensibly opposed economies are in fact deeply intertwined in wealthy capitalist countries, even countries like Israel with high degrees of social solidarity among those defined as members of the nation and to the violent exclusion of those who are not defined as members of the nation. Very few Israeli or American citizens are willing to secede from the market in response to transcendent claims. 
Absent a more direct challenge to capitalist norms, investing in blood is unlikely to generate bonds of solidarity that would empower citizens to combat the economic, national, gender, and racial hierarchies that plague our politics today. Um, and perhaps I'll allow myself to indulge in a partisan, partisan conclusion since you did as well. Um, one of the things that actually I think that your paper helped me to understand is precisely, precisely the, the perplexing question of to the extent that, that Trump still has support, why are Americans willing to support him given his shameless refusal of sacrifice and his shameless uh, 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 pr uh, advancement of his own interests? And perhaps it's precisely because um, on the one hand, while he refuses the language of sacrifice and instead shamelessly promotes the, promotes the economy of the market. At the same time, he gives Americans, or at least certain Americans, a different economy of blood, namely that of white nationalism. OK, so um, we'd like to take a few questions from the audience. But before we do this, we'll, let's uh, offer uh, Paul the opportunity to respond. Is that on? Let's see. Is this one? On? Is this on? Yeah. Uh, let's try this. Let's try this. One. Uh, Julie. Uh, well, I, I actually agree with most of what you said. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I, 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 ne I never said it was e either or. I think I used the metaphor of one foot in each. Uh, and um, I don't think uh, I, I didn't mean to suggest that um, the what I call the economy of blood is 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 a single. You know, a rhetorical trope is if we just have to go out there and argue that there's an economy of blood, we have to fill it in. As I, I said, there has to be a narrative told. All right. Now, the, the, there can be many different narratives. And the question is, well, what kind of narratives are appealing today under these contexts? What would we say? I didn't try to, to make that argument. This is just, just structural uh, in, in that sense. So, so I don't think um, you have to make a choice. I think that the idea is that both of these things have to have to be recognized as necessarily working, and and that puts a I think I said at one point you know there there's a tremendous amount of work being done in constructing these narratives all the time in in you know courts, uh, histories, film, uh, novels it's all over the place. Um, so to understand what's actually the economy of blood, we, we would have to you know write books about things like movies and plays and 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 figure out what's actually doing the work. Um, and uh, so I don't think in the abstract saying, well, you know, convincing people about sacrifice is going to solve the problems of, a, of equality. The problems of equality have to be solved on their own terms. The question is, what are the conditions under which we can make some progress on that? And, and here's why I, where I say, well, we have to understand the constitutive nature of a political community and how it relates to a, a, a identity. Uh, on, um, so, and, and, and with respect to the issues about, about gender, of course you're right. And I could have used gender just as easily as I used you know, uh, black freed slaves. It's the same point. Uh, it's not that uh, you, you know we we, we somehow un, un, uh, have a ha, have a um, uh, a, a um, uh, an, an idea of justice that's been perfectly realized in our idea of citizenship. We need an idea idea of citizenship that is robust with respect to claims of justice. So of course that's correct. Uh, and. Um, uh, uh, and, and it's not just women. I mean, I, I think, you know, it's trying to suggest it extends into the future. We have to think about, about all, 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 all sorts of different things. Um, I don't think I agree with you as so. I think you're too strong on 9-11. Uh, I, I mean, the question around 9-11 isn't just, you know, how much do we compensate these individuals? That's a question, again, of constructing just laws. The question is, you know, what, why, are we, why, are, why are we compensating them at all? Uh, why do we think that's a national problem? Um, and what do we do after 9-11? How did we organize the state in ways that, you know, I can dis disagree with, but what was the phenomena that we, we were seeing at, at, at that moment? And, and what were the political possibilities at that moment? Now, of course, they weren't used well, right. uh, but, they, but they're created and, and present. And, and that's uh, re really all I, I, I meant. And the final thing... Um, you know, you know, this paper is all too bloody. I'm, I'm sure, be, uh, be, because I, I don't mean uh, by this that citizens have to. Uh, uh, um, uh, you, you know, uh, what Thomas Jefferson said. You know, every 19 years or every generation, we should shed the blood of patriots. I don't really think that. <laughs> um, I, I'm really trying to talk here about what I call the imagination of sacrifice. It's the capacity to imagine oneself in this position that matters. That's what constructs. And limits and creates the narrative. It's not 
the need uh, to, to go out and do it. I mean, we, we, we've got, you know, we, we, we can go another few hundred years, I'm sure, just on the bloodshed of the 19th century. I mean, we're not done with the Civil War in the United States. And, and then we've got lots of wars to, 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 to think about before we have to go do, do any new ones. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's not an accident that the biggest uh, event in, in the place I live, the town I live, is the Memorial Day Parade. You know, we're still working through memorializing the idea of, of, of the veteran. Um, and, and so this imagination, I think, the sacrificial imagination, is a constant subject of, of American popular culture. And that, that's, in, in some sense, the, the, the kind of thing I'm talking about. That whether you're, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think we're going to see wars like we've seen in the past anymore, but that's another, another question. But, but we need something, uh, I'm suggesting, that, that um, is a, a political counterweight not because it's the opposite of, uh, you know, it's going to pull us out of the, uh, uh, of the market economy, but because it tells us that there's a broader domain of the political. Questions? Yeah, um, thanks for a very interesting talk. I, I wanted to thank Hobbes um, for one second. If I, if I understand correctly, what made the problem with Hobbes Inability to um, it, one of the major problems with the with the social contract theory is inability, inability to call upon a teleological suspension of the ethical, this sort of Abrahamic sacrifice, uh, in order to um, get beyond uh, uh, the, the market, overcome the market. And I, I want to say that Hobbes does have that tool, and it's the nominalism, the sort of nominalistic power of um, the contracting moment. So the, that first democratic moment when people come together to say that there will be a sovereign, not what the sovereign looks like, but that there will be a sovereign, that, that has the power to do anything. There is, there is no, there's no limit to that power. And I would argue that historically, the greatest moments of limitation to the market have actually not come through war, uh, which is very easily as Julie, I think, beautifully pointed out, the the economy of blood is co-opted by the uh, economy of, of money. They've come through the the power of a democratic sovereign to constrain market forces. So that's a sh shortcut, but I think there is a power in Hobbes that you're you're not being fair to. Well, I, I always worry that I'm not fair to Hobbes, uh, and, and I, I keep rereading him, trying to figure out if I if I, if, if I ha if I have him uh, uh, wrong, and and um. And, and, you know, I'm, I don't want to repeat what I said, but but I, I think that Hobbes does present an argument for the justice of the social contract and the justice of compliance with the social contract. He just doesn't present an argument about why we should be just, uh, uh, and that that's a harder a, a claim, I think. Um, you know, yes. Can you take the mic? Um, thank you, Professor Kahn, and thank you, Dr. Cooper, for. Um, I wanna um, I wanna offer that at least in Israel the current political moment that I'd really be uh, intrigued to hear both of you comment on that is a moment in which the politics of blood or the economy of blood is overrunning or overriding the politics of sacrifice or the community of sacrifice because we have a bunch of generals that are embodying the Israeli sacrificial myth on the one hand and on the other hand there is a national populist or a nationalist uh, a motion that actually uh, despises this politics of sacrifice in the name of a smaller tribal community of blood. And I wonder how that might figure into the matrix that you offered us and the matrix you offered us. Thank you. Well, I I'm certainly not going to um, opine on Israeli politics. <laughs> Um, but I, I will say just one, one thing. Philosophically. Philosophically, I'll say one thing. To, to talk about the economy of blood any more than to talk about the economy of markets um, uh, is, is not to say it's not controverted. Uh, I, as I, I tried to say in here, there, there, there are, are men, it's, it's, it's contested within its own terms. So, of course, we should expect that there'll be different sorts of claims and that they'll, they'll have to be resolved politically. And I, I don't know anything about Israeli politics to say how, how they're going to be resolved. But... You know, it's, it's you know, just like you know, the talk about a market economy doesn't tell you what the regulatory regime should look like. It's going to it's going to be contested, uh, and um, so I think the same here. It doesn't surprise me to be told there, there are m many different stories, and 
and uh, you know, and the, the deepest form of contestation. And now I'm, I'm speaking again about the only thing I know anything about Amer American political history is, you, you know, there's always the argument when when the state actually uses violence um, that it's just murder. It's wrong. Uh, and and so the the contest goes on at a very deep level uh, uh, there uh, as well. There's never there's never uni unanimity. In fact, I I think most of this sort of thing only appears in retrospect. It's it's history written. It's the narrative we tell ourselves after we begin to work things out, uh, and that it's always kind of a mess in the in in the present moment. But don't we get to hear about Israeli <laughs> politics? I, 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 just, I, I suppose I, I already made a partisan comment about American politics. Perhaps I can speak in a partisan fashion about Israeli politics as well. Um, but uh, um, I mean, I guess, and I maybe I'm imputing words to Shai that I shouldn't, but I, I took it that um, maybe part of the direction that you were gesturing toward or, or what was evoked in my mind was thinking about, again, the way, if the signal... Um, events or discourses of the late Netanyahu era are arguably the nation state law and corruption. And, you know, it's all in it for me. I guess we would have to think about the way in which on the one hand, there are people who are willing to, I mean, for, for many reasons that I, that I can't go into because that's not what we're here for, um, to turn a blind eye to the corruption and self dealing or say it doesn't matter, perhaps in part because they're being given a non sacrificial ethos of blood in the nation state law, right? And so that would be a place in which, again, I would see a merger between the two economies. But the other thing I was thinking about is, um, in terms of Kahol Lavan, who I think you rightly presented them as, um, uh, representing some kind of ethos of sacrifice, it would be interesting to think about their own um, difficult relationship to nation state law and wavering on the nation state law and whether they're really opposed to it or not. And to the extent that they are, I mean, there is the rhetoric of, of you know, the sacrifice of the of Druze who are now voluntarily or, or honorarily inducted into the nation while uh, many other non-Jewish citizens who do not serve are not voluntarily, uh, honorarily, sorry, um, invited into the nation. So I guess that would be a place in which even there, perhaps potentially more solidarity inspiring politics of sacrifice is not actually solidarity inspiring. And so I would see that again as perhaps another limitation of the uh, sacrificial economy of blood. Okay, so let's uh, take uh, to end in about 10 minutes. So can we collect or do you rather not? Rather I'm, not. I'm bad at collecting. Bad, bad at collecting. <laughs> so where's the mic? Well, we have it. So. Okay, thanks. I don't understand the metaphor of uh, market economics since uh, when we speak about the state, we speak about monopoly. And my second point is that uh, if we translate uh, uh, to, sacri to sacrifice to economics, to the language of economic theory, so it is uh, to pay the price. And uh, so we don't wish to to pay the price. Sometimes we have to pay uh, to pay the price, but our goal is to uh, to minimize the cost. So if if we adopt uh, the economical thinking, then it refutes uh, uh, the approach that um, we should see uh, uh, the ethos of uh, secretion. It means that sometimes there is necessity we should pay the price, but at least if we are humanist. Schmidt was anti-humanist, but if we are humanist, we don't wish to sacrifice. Thanks. Um, again, I, I find myself mostly agreeing. Um, I, I think it's a, a kind of pathology of, of the, of the uh, economy of blood to, to think that it's something we um, uh, not only do voluntarily, but what, that we uh, uh, yearn, yearn for, or somehow that this is, you know, so, so, something that we, um, the sense of out for it. I, I don't mean that at all. I, I mean that we can imagine a situation would arise under which we could imagine ourselves responding positively to the claim. That's it. Uh, you might, uh, I, you know, I, I often imagine it as standing before the draft board and you say, no, 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 I don't believe this. I'm, I'm not qualified for this. I can't do it. You know, someone else. And in the end they say, no, you, and then, then the question is, what do you do? What, what do you do? Uh, uh, and, um, and, and as long as, and, and so that's the imagination uh, uh, that, that I'm uh, imagining, that we can imagine the possibility, and that's enough. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that's completely compatible with, 
you know, I hope I never face a situation and my children never face a situation, all, all of that. Um, so I don't think um, uh, any of this is meant to suggest, you know, I, glorification is the wrong word because, I, again, I, I think when, when we write the history, we do glorify it. That's what we, we, we do. But that's not the only well, thing we do. Well, it depends on history. Right, or... right. We also criticize some of it. But it would be hard to imagine a history that was completely critical uh, in, 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 that, in, that, in that sense. So, um, uh, and I, on, uh, I wasn't sure about your, your, issue, your question about monopolies. Um, uh, there's lots of... But, uh, actually, sort of the shortest lack of time, you mentioned the Bill Okay. So I think that the theoretical analysis that you suggested, it translates into a real conundrum in constitutional law. Because if I take our Israeli constitutional law, has a protection of human dignity in it, obviously that protects human life, but it's the same in other uh, domestic uh, national documents, uh, protection of a right to life. Then in another basic law, another constitutional provision, we have this conscription, where People will have to go and obey this duty to go to the army. How is that justified? What under what um, any theoretical um, analysis? So, as you showed us, well, relying on the social contract doesn't do it. Uh, any kind of proportionality analysis would not do it. It's very difficult to explain that internally when you have, um, on the one hand, more and more states the colonialism includes these basic rights, such as the right to life, the European Court of Human Rights obviously has it. But again, states that have conscri conscription survive that analysis, that legal analysis. We know that's the, that's the case. But how can we actually um, justify it in, in constitutional terms, I think, is, uh, is a real problem. Uh, I also wanted to point out, again, looking at um, your discussion of 9-11, that there is this symbolic conscription, but I would say some people, some instances, even want to have that symbolic conscription. So, for instance, in Israel, there was a question uh, of people who uh, had uh, died in est attacks, and their relatives wanted them to be commemorated on our Memorial Day for soldiers who have fallen in wars. And it's interesting to understand why that it is a certain po politics of blood that they wanted that to be memorized in this way. Otherwise, you were just at the wrong bus stop at the wrong time, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, um, so these two uh, issues I, I just wanted to uh, comment upon. Very, very briefly, well, we have the second debate as, as, as well. Um, so that, that's common. And um, you know, I, I can't answer the first one, except to say, of course, there's been a huge argument for at least 20 years now about whether hum, human rights right, is, is a, a project, right? or is, is there a gap between law and, and politics uh, with respect to human rights? And part of the critique of human rights develops this idea that it's it's places in, places itself outside of the necessities of various sorts of the political community. How one resolves that's up up to different states. Thank you very much. Both uh, fascinating conversation and uh, obviously, uh, like always, I learned a lot from your thick descriptions and broad pictures. I I, I wonder about a few things and how they fit to the imagination of the economy of blood. Uh, but by the one of the ways to, to look about your disagreement about the 9-11s is perhaps um, with the connection between victimhood and sacrifice. In Hebrew, it's quite clear because we use the same word, but there's something about helplessness in both cases. So, uh, and that's also some existential political circumstances. <laughs> but again, I wonder about the, perhaps the differences between paying taxes and claim for sacrifice where the claim for sacrifice is about radical act, radical moment, and radical means. And, and when we talk about economy, we don't necessarily need a distinction between ordinary cost exchanges and the radical. Uh, economy could live with both on the same level, but when we talk about politics and we look and we focus on the um, sacrifice, so perhaps it is, it's, it's also distinguish between the ordinary and the radical. And perhaps it's also crucial for the political because, um, because as you said, uh, um, sacrifice is about a claim. Um, but it's not only a claim. 
taking the metaphor of the Abrahamic sacrifice is also an experiment. So it's also about taking risk. Not only the <coughs> citizens are at risk to be called to be killed and, and killed, but also the sovereign is taking the risk. Perhaps he will be disobeyed. So risk, radical, radicalism. As, as... Uh, I'm not sure I, I, I understand what you mean by, by radical, but I certainly agree with your point about risk. Uh, and um, I, I mentioned it briefly in this paper. You know, I, I, I wrote a book kind of about it. Um, it's entirely possible that, that somebody makes a claim uh, to be acting in the name of the sovereign and no one responds. Right? Entirely possible. Uh, and it's entirely possible that that person has legal authority uh, to act in the name of the sovereign and no one responds. <laughs> um, so um, it, it is all, uh, 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 well, it, it, I, I would associate that risk freedom that I was trying to, to describe uh, here. It's, it's not determined and it can't be determined as a matter of law. It's a matter of belief, uh, and beliefs change, and they respond to competing and contesting uh, uh, narratives. So, so uh, well, that, that's enough. We can talk later about taxes and radicalism. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Khan. Um, <laughs> thank you, Julie. Uh, great discussion. Thank you all for being here tonight.